Hi guys, it is a hot, sticky August day in May here and uh, the collapse of global industrial civilization up here at Bugs in Your Face Farm on Tuesday, May 31st, uh, 2022, wrapping up, wrapping up May where about 50 feet from where I'm sitting in the shade in the direct sun it is 101 degrees Fahrenheit in the direct sun before 11 o'clock in the morning <coughs> in the Finger Lakes of New York and you wonder why uh, we are doomed and civilization and everything else is collapsing uh, speaking of civilizational collapse I'm sorry, I cannot remember which one of my alert listeners sent me this latest essay from yesterday from uh, <clears throat> this fellow I've featured many times, Umer Hake, I guess. I don't know how you pronounce this guy's name, H-A-Q-U-E. So uh, anyway, uh, Umer has his newest uh, essay talking about the usual, you know, the, the usual stuff. Uh, we're going to check in with Umer. He claims this is a 12-minute read, which probably means 45 minutes for me because I guess I just talk too slow or I go off on tangents. Okay, Umer. Let me make this uh, type a little bit bigger. All right. <clears throat> A conversation about civilizational collapse. This is how civilizations collapse and why ours feels like it is beginning to. Yes, when it's 101 degrees in the sun before 11 o'clock in the morning in May in upstate New York. Uh, anyway. I'm going to put the link on here. You can read this yourself or you can just go on to the video of him being interviewed where he covers most of the same points. But if you just want to listen to some heat stroke, uh, fly bitten doomer, read it for you. I'll be happy to. Uh, but I'm putting the link on here so you can go listen to this interview yourself. Anyway, take it away, Umer. <clears throat> I recently did an interview with veteran broadcaster Anthony Davis, formerly of the BBC. I don't often do interviews these days for a simple reason. I turn down most requests from American mainstream media because they expect me to be an actor, a pundit. They are a charade in which you are expected to say certain things. I enjoyed this one because I felt that with Anthony, we could talk seriously. And then he has the link to that interview. <clears throat> and friends, we need to talk. Why? Don't take it from me. Take it from the UN, which is now warning of an increased risk of global collapse. So this is once again, this is uh, Umer Haik's take on, uh, we just heard from Nafiz Ahmed, uh, when was that, yesterday or on Sunday, and now Umer Haik is, warn is weighing in on this. And then if you haven't seen this, and he links you over to these latest dire stark Okay, so there's going to be some repetition between now and what I said. But this is how Umer Haik uh, is spinning uh, the latest dire stark reports from the UN. <clears throat> okay, uh, the UN is now warning of an increased risk of global collapse. How so? Quote, when global collapse risk is analyzed according to the nine planetary boundaries, scenarios that consider achievement of these sustainable development goals and Sendai framework goals 
within the concept of planetary boundaries show a dangerous tendency for the world to move towards a global collapse scenario. Okay, so what does that mean according to Umer Hake? We are living now in the event extinction. It is beginning all around us, meaning the extinction event with capital double E is beginning all around us. You can begin to see it with your own two eyes now, birds falling dead from the sky and a scorched subcontinent, <clears throat> war, lunatics taking control of societies as they give up on the future, ecologies crashing and literally burning. It used to be a guess, a scenario, a theory now you can literally begin to see it happening. This is extinction with a capital E. Anthony and I talked about many things, collapse, failure, risk, that oh-so-American accusation, alarmism. Let me tie up a few threads of our discussion here using the notion of global collapse. <clears throat> Anthony raised the point that people like me, us, meaning doomers, are often dismissed as alarmist, which is because Americans in particular need a certain tone, one of sober-minded optimism. But what if the facts, the facts point to a different conclusion, you know, than optimism. Me, I would rather be making music. Facts get in the way. Let's discuss a few, a few inconvenient ones that I have come to observe as an economist that alarm me. Fact number one. <clears throat> there are not many economists left who study our civilization. They're taught not to. The answer you're inculcated into when you study economics is that markets will solve everything. So hey, just put a market in place of something and presto, you don't ever have to look at a fact again. But when you do, if you do, <clears throat> The way that the UN looks at the future is bottom up. They outline certain scenarios. They have to do with climate change and whether goals are being met or enough pledges are being made. And every year or so, what happens is that the worst set of cases of all these scenarios seems to be coming true. That is for a simple reason. Pledges and goals are easy, but fulfilling them is much, much harder. Inconvenient fact number two. The way that I look at the future, one way I do is top down. What does that mean? It means I look at the hard facts of our civilization, not pledges and goals, but what you can call the macroeconomics of our civilization. And those macroeconomics are incredibly troubling. Let me give you three facts I discussed with Anthony that to me point squarely to global collapse. So is this fact number four, or is this fact number 3A? Anyway, we're, I'm losing track of the inconvenient facts. We're breaking down the inconvenient facts into subsets of in, inconvenient facts. <clears throat> All right. Everything for a civilization has to do with investment. Investment is the linchpin of the project of civilization. 
town squares, universities, science, art, literature, medicine, all of these come from investment. Civilization, in a very real sense, is just the act of collective investment. That is how we come to be civilized, to have things like schools and roads and hospitals and drugs and books and so forth. And then we live, hopefully, in peace and intelligence and with empathy. Everything depends on investment. Our investment rate as a civilization is about 20% give or take. That sounds high, maybe, but you need context to really understand it. What does 20% investment get you? It gets you America. That's America's investment rate, too. Now, of course, the uh, breeze is coming up. As nice as that feels, I uh, don't know what it's going to be doing to the uh, to the rest of this. I might have to put a windscreen up and get rid of the dog. Anyway, uh, what does 20% investment get you? It gets you America. That's America's investment rate too. And we can see from the example of America that it is not enough. America does not have any functioning systems. Healthcare, retirement, education, even food. People live miserable enough lives that downward mobility has become the norm. And they have turned atavistic. They are seeking belonging, meaning, stability, purpose, in regress as their society simply falls apart. So they have turned back to every kind of lunacy from fundamentalist religion to authoritarianism to supremacy and all of those put together. The vicious cycle of collapse accelerates this way because this atavistic turn makes investment more or less impossible and so collapse hits harder and faster. So, fact one. We know that 20% is not enough to keep the project of civilization going to stop the event, meaning the extinction event, which is now beginning, which will cleave human history in two. Extinction. Human beings have been around for 300,000 years. The last time the planet was as hot as it is getting was millions of years ago. We have never, ever experienced anything like what is beginning now and human history will regard it and human history will regard it is it as its greatest cataclysm and defining event this is the age of extinction yes we do have this typo, an unfortunate typo. Human history will regard, you know, what is unfolding right now on this planet where it is 101 degrees in upstate New York in May at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, human history will regard this moment as its greatest cataclysm and defining event. This is the age of extinction, and that is happening because 20% is too low. Fact two, how high does our civilizational investment rate need to be to do something about the event? Extinction. 
can we stop it or even try to lessen it? What would have to be done? Or do we just keep looking at goals and pledges and then next year saying it's getting worse and worse? <coughs> the temperature's getting hotter. It's 50 degrees Celsius in the Indian subcontinent. Europe is scorching. The American West is running out of water. How much longer do we have? Extinction. The answer lies in looking at the only region in the world which has managed to cut carbon emissions. There is only one, Europe. And Europe has an investment rate of 50%. That's why Europeans enjoy all those things they're renowned for that Americans don't have. Good hospitals, schools, retirements, affordable educations, the right to live in dignity without massacres every week. And that investment rate, too, is what begins to be necessary to begin to put the brakes on the runaway train of the event. So, we have an investment rate of 20% as a civilization. We need one of 50%. These are facts. They are not just idle opinions. They are not alarmism or hyperbole or exaggeration or any of the rest of it. They are empirical truths about the world we live in. Without a dramatic transformation in our civilizational economics, just as the UN says, we are heading for collapse. The difference between me and the UN is that I am more certain of it because, like I explained, the way I think about it is top-down, beginning with civilizational macroeconomics allows me to see the whole picture at once, and hopefully you can too you can begin to see how big this gap really is. Guys, I'm gonna break in here a minute. I, I admit, I'm gonna sheepishly admit, I don't know what the hell Umer is talking about, okay? I, I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and argue with Umer Hake, all right? Uh, and uh, a lot of me, is figuring he's probably right, but since I don't have any clue what the man is talking about, other than we're doomed, I can understand that. Now, again, I'm not going to debate with Umer Haik, but do I hear Umer Haik saying that if the entire planet lived like Europe, that this would be some sort of Shangri-La planet. If that is what Umer Haik is saying, and it sounds like he is, then I personally am going to be more of a doomer than Umer. Uh, it might be a little more comfortable for a uh, buttload of people to have a European uh, standard of living uh, than we have on this planet, but my guess is if the entire planet went to a European standard of living, uh, every one of our fellow earthlings would be extinct even faster than they're going to be extinct now. Anyway, done with my little uh, admission of uh, having no clue what the man is talking about but it makes sense to me even though I don't understand it. But let's get to fact three. Our entire global economy needs to transform radically in, and dramatically in the next decade. Two decades tops three or collapse accelerates and continues 
ex it spreads outwards from America and engulfs the world. Again, I have been saying since I've been studying this, it spreads outward from sub-Saharan Africa and engulfs the world. But uh, again, uh, Umer, probably a smarter man than me. So Umer's call is that it, that collapse will spread outward from America and engulf the world. The lights begin to go out. We're already living in an era now of shortages, inflation, uncertainty, war, conflict, nationalism, fascism, fundamentalism, all that spreads and takes hold and this atavistic turn that has taken place in America and India and Russia and so forth goes viral. Why do I say that? 20% needs to come 50%. But how big is that number? In hard terms, our economy as a civilization is, let's call it $100 trillion for simplicity's sake. We invest $20 trillion of that back. It's not high enough. That number needs to rise from $20 trillion to $50 trillion, that is $30 trillion in a decade or two. We need the greatest wave of investment in human history in all the 300,000 years since humanity first took its steps. The greatest one. What does that investment wave have to do? It has to provide decarbonized basics from food to water to energy. But even deeper than that, as Vaclav Smeal has pointed out in this essay that I read a couple of weeks ago that he uh, links you over to, but even deeper than that, as Vaclav Smeal has pointed out, our civilization's big four, fertilizer, glass, cement, and steel, all depend critically on hydrocarbons. We need to make those clean too, and then we need to provide every human being on planet Earth with a little money food, water, shelter, sanitation, and education, so that fascism, which has already returned, is stopped in its tracks. Big job, big jobs. Why do we have, at this point, three generations of chronically underemployed young people who are fast losing faith and optimism in the future, who barely believe that there will be a future. Why is the feeling that young people will live worse lives than their elders? <coughs> because we are not doing this work. <coughs> Think about all the jobs, this transformation, and again, it is the greatest one in human history would provide. Everything from young people figuring out how to make clean steel, clean energy, glass, cement, agriculture, to entire categories of careers and jobs we haven't even imagined yet. Extinction Guardian, someone whose job it is to protect collapsing ecologies. Ecosystem architect, someone whose job it is to keep our critical ecologies alive, the ones that provide us food, water, air, and medicine. How about planetary systems manager, 
someone whose job it is to make sure every kid in the world is getting the education or water or food they deserve. Think of the fact that we don't even know how many species are going extinct. How basic is that job? Just counting for a species like us on a dying planet? We could just begin with life systems accountants. Now think of all the new institutions those new jobs would require creating. A planetary extinction agency, a global systems fund, a life on earth development foundation, and so on and so on. We don't have any of those. Any of them really. What we have are the ones left over from the last world war. The UN's development agency and its children agency and so on. They do good, vital, crucial work, but we need to go much, much further now. We need to invest the greatest amount in human history in the shortest period of time or our civilization is going to collapse. Again, you could accuse me, and I would say all the rest of the Doomers, of all the things you like. I have only spoken to you about facts, empirical truth about the world we live in. None of this is anything but grounded in those truths. I have taken you on a brief tour of civilizational macro economics. And uh, as I say, uh, I failed. Uh, anyway, moving on. Now, what does global collapse mean? Collapse is a technical formal term. It's not something that I or any good thinker says to scare you. It is meant literally in a few ways the collapse of economics, of social structures, of systems, and of institutions. And he forgot the planet. He left off, let's see, economics, social structures, systems, and institutions. I do not see the planet on the list of what Global collapse means, according to Umer Haig. Anyway, global collapse means all those things, and it is already here. How much more do you pay for food this year than a couple of years ago? For fuel, for everything, I pay $20 for a box of one-inch screws at Lowe's last night. Anyway, uh... Inflation is surging, and the cause is not just war. It is cataclysm, the event, extinction. Harvests are beginning to fail. The water is beginning to run out. What dirty fuel there is left <clears throat> is left in the hands of fascists and lunatics. Inflation is here, and it is not going to stop. Sure, there will be little hiccups here and there, but now we are in the age of fighting over the last few resources on a dying planet. Those conflicts have already begun. Russia's war on Ukraine is about controlling the world's food and oil and gas supplies. And while Russia is losing soldiers, it's succeeding to an extent in that objective. This dismal trend will, of course, only continue because on a dying planet, without investment, there is not going to be enough to go around. Think of the Indian subcontinent. 
Hindus and Muslims are already at each other's throats. Now imagine what happens when it hits 60 degrees Celsius in the summer and the water is running out. Bang! Resource conflicts are not going to happen. They already are. With extinction comes the collapse of systems that we take for granted. I would reword that to read with the collapse of systems that we take for granted comes extinction. Anyway, semantics. With extinction comes the collapse of systems that we take for granted. My Western friends think they can turn on the AC, retreat indoors forever, and ignore the plight of a dying planet. They're wrong. What are they going to eat? Drink. Where's their medicine going to come from? What happens as energy grids fail? Extinction is going to bring with it the breakdown of all these basic systems, and again, that is already beginning. In the Indian subcontinent, it's 50 degrees C already, and energy grids are failing. Water is a precious commodity. Food is skyrocketing in price because the scorched Punjab feeds 2 billion people and the harvest are failing. What happens as systems fail? People lose their moorings. They turn on their neighbors and friends desperate to feed their kids. They seek some kind of explanation for it all in fundamentalist religion. They seek some kind of optimistic vision for the future in authoritarianism. They look for already hated groups to scapegoat for it in neo-fascism. The entire project of civilization begins to come undone. You can see this happening in America, which is why I use it as an example. Being the world's richest country has not protected America from all these forms of collapse because the resources, money, time, everything has been hoarded by the super rich who own it all. And the average person has been getting poorer for decades now. Now, life in America is a bitter, brutal struggle for the basics. Health care, education, shelter, a little money to pay off all that debt, some kind of job to have it, one tiny misstep and you will lose it all. It is a fight to the death. He forgot the uh, rocking horse budget and the hanging basket flower budget and the grass seed budget and the kitchen extension budget. Anyway, uh, as life is falling apart here at Bugs in Your Face Farm. <coughs> okay. It is a fight to the death and an increasingly brutal one. The, that fight has torn Americans apart. It has destroyed what was left of America's social capital, its trust, relationships, community. Americans don't just distrust one another now, they actively hate one another. Everything is bitter, rancorous, and raised. There is no public life. Nobody smiles. America is a divided nation, and half of it wants to go back to some kind of weird, medieval, slash fastic, fascist fantasy land. This is what the end of civilization looks like. At least part of it, 
the other half you can see in the Indian subcontinent. I, I wonder why he's, he has never mentioned the word Africa subcontinent anywhere in the story. The other half you can see in the Indian subcontinent, there it doesn't feel that way so much because it still has social capital. There are religious and ethnic divisions, but within those communities, people still like and trust one another, but resources are now in seriously short supply. What do you do when it is 50 degrees and the lights go out all day? Or the taps stop running, or there is no medicine left because it's all spoiled. Westerners think, he is saying life is coming to an end. No, it doesn't. Civilization does. Life goes on, but living in a civilized way becomes harder and harder. A dark age falls. Extinction, and I always have to add this caveat for new readers, so, for, so forgive me, extinction does not mean everyone dies. It means that there is an extinction event now unfolding. A huge, huge number of the Earth species are going to be gone. You know, if you're a member of uh, about a million of our fellow Earthlings, it does mean everyone dies. <clears throat> A huge, huge number of the Earth species are going to be gone. So many, we cannot even count them yet. Trees, forests, animals, all of that is going to cause a systems collapse, collapse which it already is. Corona panic was not a fluke. We are learning now that it was a part of a trend, pandemics, which happen when animals and humans rub shoulders as habitable land is scorched, burned, flooded, drowned. Extinction is an event. It means many, many things. We are all going to have to understand it in subtle and complicated and thoughtful ways. I don't bring it up so you just panic and react and some people lash out defensively thinking, he's saying we're all gonna die. Quite the opposite. I mean we are now beginning to live through the single event of greatest impact in human history ever. And this is what I have been saying since day one, that what we are going through right now, today, on this 101 degree day in the sun in upstate New York in May, is the single, uh, the single biggest story in the history of humanity. It is bigger than the invention of fire. It is bigger than the invention of agriculture. It is bigger than the Industrial Revolution. It is bigger than every war humans have ever fought. It is unfolding in front of your face today, and 99.9% .9 of the planet either uh, they are completely unaware of this, or if they are made aware of it, they do not want to hear it. They don't want to hear about the single biggest event in the history of humanity since before we invented fire. And uh, nobody wants to hear this shit. And we need to begin to understand this in genuinely thoughtful and precise and reflective ways. So far, we don't even have the vocabulary 
I think we do. So far, we don't even have the vocabulary, the language, ideas, which is why I write about it. And this is why I sit here in this chair every day talking about it for the five or six people on the planet who want to hear one word of this shit. So, let's draw some conclusions. Are we headed for global collapse? I gave you three facts. My conclusion from those three facts is that we need the greatest wave of investment in human history to even begin to lessen the impact of extinction. The more we do that, the more chance of surviving in some form our civilization has. But if we don't do it all, which is where we are now, if we don't do it at all, which is where we are now, sorry, let me add one last fact. We need the greatest wave of investment in human history to begin to lessen the event extinction, but fact four, our investment rate is still exactly the same. This is why every year the UN has to do this sad dance. Goals and pledges unmet. The worst case scenarios come true. The investment rate, our investment rate civilizationally is not rising. And you can now see what happens when it doesn't. With your own eyes, the temperatures keep rising. Nations like America simply fall apart. Demagoguery and fascism recur. Resource wars erupt. Religious and ethnic tensions alight. Ecologies collapse. Our basic systems begin to fail. We are now living in the event. You can now literally begin to see what it means to be a species living on a dying planet. You can see with your own two eyes what happens when a civilization's investment rate is too low and its consumption rate is too high. This does extinction. It eats through everything and replenishes not enough and so its own life support system come undone. And my computer decides to go crazy on the last paragraph. <clears throat> so its own life support systems come undone this is where we are now. We are travelers into the event, and we need to begin, begin preparing for this journey, my friends. Nobody is going to escape to Mars. Nobody is going to live in some fortified compound and ride it out. We are in it together, this planet, civilization, extinction. And there you go. Don't you love uh, the hopium in that article? I, I don't have to say, Umer Hake is not an apocalyptimist, uh, but anyway, uh, I've been trying to invest in some uh, of these little save the planet plastic, you know, made in China plastic uh, dragonfly solar lights for my uh, tiny house. And uh, good God, uh, but my investment in these little plastic lights is not panning out and so I have to go to the UPS store now to uh, return my little failing collapsing uh, 
dragonfly lights for my tiny house is uh, what I have to deal with today. And then we're going to go help Sister Sandy uh, put in her drip irrigation system in this New York heat wave so she can have some fresh tomatoes for this summer. Anyway, get out there and put in your own drip irrigation system while you still have some water to go drip, drip, drip. Bye, guys. Okay, little dog. Did you survive that? Zip up. I'm going to get that snake you like that. I see that snake over there. I see that snake. You need to go get that snakey like that. We actually have a school of trout swimming around in the pool in the creek. I have to go get me some fresh trout for dinner. My gosh.